glad to be here today. Amen. It's a good day to be in God's house, isn't it? But you know one of the greatest things that we have about God is, is, I mean, we have the spiritual aspect of being in God's house and, and worshiping Him and just, you know, asking Him to open up the heavens. We want to see Jesus. But, but we also have here in this country that, that, that aspect of the freedom. The freedom that, that we can be here. You know, we, we came and we sang and we, we, we watched the, the video of Bible school and, and all last week we brought our kids and we felt safe because we have a freedom to worship as we please. And we, you know, we have a thought this morning about, you know, what if our government would come busting through the doors and say, you can't be here. You know, and in a lot of places in, in, around the world, that's what they face. Christians in many nations and many countries, you know, that they worship in hiding. That they worship in secret. Because they don't have the freedom that we have. You know, I'm, I'm glad that in this country we have that freedom, that we can worship God as we please. Now, we know Tuesday we, we celebrate the, the independence of America, and, and this was kind of one of those weeks where we started early. You know, we, we've already here in our town had, had fireworks and, and all kinds of festivities and parades and, and all kinds of things going on, celebrating the, the independence or the freedom that, that we have in America. You know, being in this nation, and, and we celebrate that freedom. And, you know, and I remember, you know, I watched as we sang the patriotic songs. And, and, you know, and everybody stood for the patriotic songs. And I can remember, I was, I don't know how old I was, but my job was to take Uncle Horace to the parade. Now, Uncle Horace was probably 90, 91, 92 at that time. Uncle Horace was a World War I vet. And, and, and it, our, our little town was having our, our fair for the week, and, and the parade was on a Tuesday, and, and it was my job to take off a horse to the parade. So, I, you know, I couldn't get him there too early because, you know, he wasn't as young as he used to be, and, and, and you know, and I had to get him as close, so I'm, like, driving through people's yards and up back streets and on the sidewalk to get him as close as I can. I get him there, and, and you know, as close as I possibly can to the parade ground. And then I, I have to get Uncle Horse from, from the car to the parade. And, and you have to keep in mind, this was Uncle Horse's top speed. <laughs> you know, and it's my job. And it, I, as I was a young adult, you know, I could move a little faster than Uncle Horse. But here went Uncle Horse. You know, so I'm carrying his chair and, and everything. And, and I, of course, you know, you know what kind of horse? Yeah. You know, well, where are we going to sit? Well, as close as we can. And finally, we get to the place, and I get him in his seat, and, you know, some of the folks around, we kind of help him get seated down in, into to the, because, you know, lawn chairs aren't the easiest things to get in and out of, and especially when this is max speed. And, and we get him in there, and we wait for the end of we're early. And it comes time for the parade. And we all know well, what, what leads the parade. The flags. Now, all horse had come from the truck like this. But when he looked at it, and he saw the, the soldiers carrying flags, I don't know what happened on the horse. But out of that lawn chair he'd come, stood up a straighter than I'd ever seen him stand. His hand was on his heart. And he stood there and saluted as the flags went by. And after the uncle horse, I never saw you move so fast. He said, boy, you have to understand, this is America. We have freedom. You know, so think about that. It's an awesome, awesome freedom. But you know, as free as we have in this country, there's an even greater freedom. And, and Jesus tells us about that freedom. And it's a freedom that comes through him. So as we celebrate the freedom that we have as Americans, I want us to think of the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ when he said, ye shall be free indeed. And that passage comes from John chapter 8. So you've already turned there. Let's begin at verse 31 and just read that, read that passage. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then answered him, We be Abraham's seed, 
and were never in bondage to any man, how sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. As we focus on this freedom, as we think about that, there's some things that we need to see. Jesus tells us that if we know the truth, if we are his disciples, we will know the truth, and the truth will make us free indeed. Now, from this passage, I noticed a couple things I, I want to look at real quick uh, just to kind of help to set the stage. Number one is that they were free, they, or they thought they were free because of who they were. You know, he says, you know, if you're my disciples, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And he said, you know, they're like, well, we're the seed of Abraham. <coughs> Nobody has ever held us in bondage. So, so, you know, we're already free. How can you say that we're going to have free? We're free right now. You know, now, we know at that particular time, they were, the, the whole nation was in bondage to the Roman government. We know that in the past, they didn't, they didn't bondage, as the, the nation began, they were in bondage in Egypt. But they said, we're the seed of Abraham. We are free, and nobody else can change that. And they were thinking it was all about what they do. But Jesus was talking about a greater freedom. So they thought they were free only because of what they do. The second thing that I saw there is Jesus told them that if they were sinners, and because they were sinners, they were in bondage to sin. And you know that, that's what sin does to us. Sin puts us in bondage. And the sad fact is, is we're all sinners. We can't help it. We're born that way. We're sin and that sin is a bondage uh, that just wraps us up. I mean, how many times in our life have we tried to be good? We've tried to do things different. We've tried to change things. We've tried to make them better in our lives. And over and over and over we fail. Why? Because we're in sin. Well, and, and, and that sin nature, we're in bondage to it. So Jesus says, if you are a sinner, then you are in bondage to sin. So therefore, because of that bondage, they need their freedom. Far greater than the freedom of the nation of Israel. They need a freedom that only Jesus can give. So this morning, I want us to look at two things. Two things that, that we have in the freedom of Jesus Christ. But to understand that, the first thing we have to look at is we have to look at freedom's price. What does it cost? You know, freedom doesn't come cheap. There's a price for freedom. There's a cost for freedom. And to help us to understand that, let's first look at the price for the country's freedom. Now, you all are, are smart, intelligent American people. And you know a lot of the history of the nation. So I don't have to stand here and tell you. But we know that our nation began, and, and the Revolutionary War was the war that, that separated us from the bondage of England. And, and all of those who fought were part of that and, and, and made us the country that, that we were to become. You know, set us apart as the, the United States of America. But then following that, you know, there have been other wars. In our own nation, there was the Civil War. And, and there's some rough numbers that I come up with. In the Civil War, 618,000 people were killed. Another 400,000 wounded just in, the, in our nation in the Civil War that took place. Then in the early 1900s, it was World War I. Over 50,000 U.S. soldiers were killed during that war. Over 205,000. Were wounded. Later, World War II. 292,000 soldiers killed. I mean, we could go on and on. The Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf Wars, other battles, other conflicts. But, but here's the thing. Over time, there have been men and women, Americans, who gave their lives so that we could have the freedom that we do in the nation. You know, as we celebrate our independence, it's not just about that time when we separated from England and became our own nation. It is, it's a freedom that we have in that nation. A freedom that has cost something. For every one of those who, who gave their lives in, in a war or a scrimmage or something, that there's always been those families who were left hurting. 
You know, not only those who gave the ultimate, but, the, but those who were left hurting. There was a price for freedom. Freedom isn't free. And it definitely doesn't come cheap. And just by looking at our country's freedom, we understand that many have lost their lives so that America could be free and stay free. America's freedom has had a great price tag. Now, as we look at that, we understand that the freedom in America wasn't free. There was a cost. You say, well, what about as a Christian? You told us there's a greater freedom in Jesus Christ. Let's look at the price for a Christian's, Christian's freedom. The, the price that it cost for us to be free in Jesus. Jesus says, you'll be free indeed. You are my disciples will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What is the cost for the Christian's freedom? I think the old hymn writer probably said it best. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But when we think about the freedom that we have in Jesus, we have to look at the price that he paid. That price started with the fact that they abused him. Matthew chapter 26 says, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. So, so just, just to start to look at, at the price that Christ paid, it started with the abuse. The abuse just from the public and the crowd. And then it went to, to the scourgings. You remember they, they brought him before Pilate, and, and Pilate really couldn't find anything to, to accuse him of. And Pilate, he tried to send him off to Herod, and Herod blessed him, and Herod says, there ain't nothing here, sitting back to Pilate. You know, but the people said, crucify him, crucify him. We want him dead. So in order to, to try to, to, to make the people kind of happy, Pilate sent him off to be beaten. Scourging. Now, you know, when we think of it, a lot of times we don't get quite the picture of what Jesus went through. So I want to try just a little way to give you a picture of that scourging. What they would have is, is they would take them, and the Jews had a rule. The Jewish rules was you could not beat a person over 40 times. So the Jews, in order, I mean, because if you did, then you deserve that same punishment. So the Jews made a rule so that they didn't go over 40. They said 40 minus 1. So they would never beat anybody more than 39 stripes. But it wasn't the Jews that was beating Jesus. It was the Romans. The Romans didn't have such a rule. And, and Roman scourging, they, they had another name for it. They called it the half-death. Because the way they would do it is they would take a whip, kind of like what we might call a cat of nine tails, kind of a leather whip that, that on the end of it had all these little leather pieces that come out. And usually what they would do is, is in those leather pieces at the end, they would have like pieces of bone or broken pottery or something like that sewn in there. And they would have two folks, and they were called lictors. They would be Roman soldiers trained to do this. And, and, and one of them, or at least one of them, would be uh, medically trained as well. And the idea was they were they would try to whip that person within that point of their life where if they thought if one more stripe hit them, they'd die. So they they beat them for a while, and then the, the medically trained one would go and check them and check like pulse red perforation and all that. And you know, hey, we can do some more, let's beat them some more. And they would usually start with the whip and, and just kind of lash it against the back. And, and, and it would start by, by by tenderizing, if you want to say. And then it would bring the bruising, you know, and the, the soreness from that. But then after a certain amount of strength, they would start as, as they hit, they would kind of give a little twist. And, and the bones and the pottery and the thin side would serve into the end of that whip, would then cut into the flesh. And when they would jerk the whip back, it would rip the flesh. You know, and, and they would do that, and then, and then they'd stop, and the, the medically trained one would go and check the body again. Hey, I think we can do some more. And the reason they called it the half-death was... Sometimes they went just a little overboard. And they went that one stripe too many. And that was okay. It was scourging according to the Romans. But not only was Jesus mocked, but he was scourged as well. But that wasn't the worst of it. We know that they, they made fun of him. They, they put a crown of thorns on his head. That they stripped him. They abused him. That they made him carry his cross. Then they nailed his hands and feet. And hung him till he died. Now he's already been beaten within that, that, what we might say, that half inch of his life. And then they nail him to a cross. 
Now, to help you understand that a little bit, let me tell you a little bit about Roman crucifixion. Roman crucifixion, still to this day, is listed as one of the most cruel deaths known to mankind because of the way they did it. Because, you see, if you would just hang a person by their hands, we know that Hitler did this uh, to, to the Jews as he killed many of them. He would just strap their hands to, to a beam or a pipe. And within a, a fairly short time, you know, their, their bodies would fill up with fluids, and basically they'd suffocate themselves, and they'd die. You know, if you were to just nail the, the hands to the cross, you'd have had the pain that seared through the body from the nails. And, and they were, you know, when we say hands and feet, but we know it probably wasn't right here. It was probably more right here where they were nailed. Just for the simple fact, this wouldn't hold the weight of a man. It, it would rip out. There's nothing there to hold it. So they put it here. Now, when you put it here, those nails would go through the median nerve. And, and there, there's no way anywhere in there that you could not hit it. Now, anybody that's ever had carpal tunnel, you have just a little idea of what that was. Because those folks have had carpal tunnel, they tell me that's some of the worst pain they've ever had. But when those nails would hit that medial nerve, it would just shoot fire throughout the body. A fire that would never, ever hit, never hit. And they would hang them there. But the Romans did something else. They would kind of bend their knees a little bit, put the feet together, and they would drive a spike through the feet into the cross. And, and with the knees bent, because our, our human nature, our human nature is to survive. So as Jesus or any other person hung on the cross would hang there, you know, as the body would droop and the fluids would begin to fill up and, and the fluids would start to go around the lungs and start to suffocate, everything within ourselves would be to try everything we could. So with their feet, because their feet were nailed, they could now shove up and struggle and get another breath to continue in life. Crucifixion just for the arms, well, they would die fairly quickly. But by nailing the feet, Strong men could last a couple days. That's what they did to Jesus. They nailed him to a cross to die the cruelest death, or one of the cruelest deaths at least, that man has ever known. You say, well, why? Why did he do it? You know, crucifixion was the, the death of a criminal or the punishment of a criminal. Jesus was not a criminal. Matter of fact, Jesus wasn't even a sinner. He died to pay for us. He died to pay the price for freedom. Not his. He already had that freedom. He died to pay the price of our freedom. And when he died on that cross, everything that they put him through, that was the price of the Christian's freedom. And my friends, I want you to know something. He did it willingly. Our Bible tells us he could have called legions of angels to come and take him off that cross. And we know the power of one angel in the Old Testament defeated the strongest army known to man in that day. One night, one angel come and just wiped out the, the, the whole army. Jesus could have called legions. They could have took over the Roman army. They, they could have took him down off the cross. But he willingly died. Our Bible says that as he hung there, he gave up the gun. He, 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 he didn't die, but he gave his life on that cross. That was the price for the Christian's freedom. So today, as we celebrate freedom, we know the price that was paid in our country. But now we know the price that was paid for me and for you. That's the price. Freedom isn't free. And the cost was the ultimate to Jesus. But I want us to look at another aspect. Now that we know the price, we need to see freedom's purpose. <coughs> Why? Why did so many in a nation be willing to die so that we can be free? I can remember I was a young adult when the, the first Gulf War uh, started. And, you know, I remember the, the, the operation where, where they were going in. And, and I remember the night when, when they, all of a sudden the, the war attacks started. And I can remember folks that I knew who were going to enlist to say, we want to go fight. We want to go be a part of that. You know, there was a part of me that said, man, why would you do that? 
Why would you go volunteer? I remember one dad who said, you know, I've served my time in the military, but I'm going to go see if they'll take me back. Because if I go fight this fight, maybe my sons won't have to later. They would fight. You know, women said, why? Because there's a price for freedom. But when we think of freedom, the price, we have to say, why? What is the purpose? So to understand, let, let's look at first the purpose of the country's freedom. You know, why, why back in the days of the Revolutionary War, why did those men go off, leave their farms, leave their families to go fight? Because they wanted to be separated from England. They wanted to be able to go and worship as they pleased and not be have a church that was run by the government. Because, see, that's what they had. In England, the, the government run the church. Folks couldn't go and worship however they wanted. They couldn't go and worship Jesus in the way that they chose. The government told them what to do. That had been going on for years and years. It started way back in the days of, of Constantine. When Constantine looked at the Christians and said, trying to, to wipe them out, it didn't work. It. So let's all become one. He said, everybody needs to become a Christian. And the only thing he knew that made a Christian different was they needed to be baptized. So all of his family was baptized. And all of his soldiers were baptized. And he just declared that everybody needed to be baptized. And we began a government-run church. And over years and centuries, the government continued to run the church until the days that even as folks were coming to this country that we would call America, the government would still tell them, this is how you worship. So they came to this country, but England still had hold on them. They said, we want to worship as we please. We want to worship our Lord in the way that we see fit. So the purpose, they sought to be free of a government-run church. A second purpose that I find in the Revolutionary War was that they sought to be free of a tax without representation. That they were paying taxes to England, but those in America had no say in the matter. That they, were, they, were, they had to pay their taxes. Remember the whole story about the Boston Tea Party? It was over taxes. And, and, and they had to pay, but, the, but nobody got to go from America to England to say, hey, in America we vote this way. So they sought to, to, to be free of a tax where they had no representation. There was a purpose. The freedom that they had, that they were willing to pay the price for, there was a purpose for that freedom. So we look at the purpose of the country's freedom. Now we have to look at the purpose of the Christian. What was the purpose for Jesus to die? Well, obviously our salvation. He paid a price that we couldn't pay. He died for our sins because we couldn't do that. Because if we were to die in our sins, we're dead. There's no eternal life. It is punishment in hell. But Jesus could die and be rose again. He was perfect. So obviously the purpose was for our salvation. But just say, how about us? A couple of things I thought of was, number one, we're saved to serve. You know, when we're saved in Jesus Christ, his purpose for dying on the cross was so that we could have a freedom to serve him. Let me give you a few scriptures to prove it. The first one is going to be Romans chapter 6, verse 18. It says, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Did you see that? Being made free, you are no longer a slave to sin. You're a servant. You're a servant of righteousness. Well, the purpose was, was so that we could serve him. The next one is Romans 6, 22. Being now being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Because of the freedom that we have in Jesus, we become servants. And that servant has continued. It has shown there are fruits. We serve him. We're, we're saved to serve. We're made free so that we can serve him. The last one I want to give you is Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Over and over and over in Scripture we find the purpose of the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. As a Christian, our purpose is to serve. Now, 
Okay, you know. Throughout this, this past weekend and, and even into through Tuesday, there's been a lot of celebrations of the freedom of the nation. And we have every right to celebrate. Well, we are one of the few free nations in the face of the earth that, that has the freedom, especially to come and worship like we do. We have a right to celebrate. I'm proud of being American. I'll put my hand over my heart when I say the pledge, when the flag comes by. Because of the freedom that's been paid for. But you know, we have a greater freedom. And that freedom is in Jesus. And as we have that relationship with him, that, that freedom is ours. Nicodemus said, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, you must be born again. When we become born again, only through Jesus can we do that. We have a freedom beyond anything else. And what does that freedom lead us to do? That freedom leads us to serve Him. That's the purpose. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. I, I can sum this up real quick. Are we showing our freedom through our service? Because you see, if we have the freedom, then we want to serve. If we don't want to serve, then we're probably still held in bondage. Oh, I know. We have all kinds of excuses. I'm too tired. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too slow. I'm too fast. We can come up with all kinds of reasons why we don't want to serve. But you know, the truth is, if we're not serving, then we're probably still in bondage to, to sin. But today, you can have that freedom. Maybe you're here this morning and you never transferred your trust from yourself to Jesus. You're, you're still holding on to you. I can go to church enough times. I, I can be a good person. I can do good deeds. I can help others. And one day I'll stand before Jesus and I'll still be a sinner. The scripture tells us we can transfer our trust from ourselves to him. He died for those sins. Already paid the price in full. No other price would need to be paid. And if we believe on him, we can stand before him free and blameless. Because we have that relationship. It's freedom. And maybe this morning, you're not experiencing that. I want you to know you can. As you trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord. We told the kids all week, it's as simple as ABC. Admitting God that you're a sinner. You know, the first step is we have to realize we need a Savior. Now, we're not, we're not sharing anything new to God. God already knows our heart's condition. He knows that we're sin sin sinners by nature. <clears throat> but for us, the admitting is us agreeing with God and saying, God, I am a sinner. And because I'm a sinner, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. The B, believing in Jesus as God's Son. Believing that when He died on that cross, all those things that He went through was the price that had to be paid for my freedom and yours. And C, confessing our faith in Him to trust Him as Savior and Lord. Scripture says we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. That Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe this morning, you've never prayed that prayer. That prayer to say, God, I am a sinner. But I believe that Jesus died for my price. And today, I want to transfer my trust from me and my sin to Jesus. And I want to be a slave to him, not to sin anymore. Our Bible tells us, and the Holy Spirit promises us that when we mean that with all of our being, that we belong to Jesus Christ. Today, are you willing to make this Independence Day the greatest day of freedom you've ever had? As you surrender your life to Jesus, He paid the price. And now it's up to Maybe you're here this morning and you know that you're a Christian. There's no doubt in your mind. You know that you, you've truly been born again. But maybe right now there's some things in your life that shouldn't be going on. Maybe, maybe part
part of the way you're living you shouldn't be. Part of the things you're doing or saying. Or maybe there's things that shouldn't be going on that aren't. And it's time for you to live for Jesus. You can call it rededicating your life if you want to. But it's saying, God, I've sinned. I'm, I, I belong to you, but I'm not living for you. I've not been your servant. Today I want to confess my sin and ask your forgiveness. Turn from that sin and live for you. Maybe today that needs to be your prayer. Or maybe today just in life, there's burdens that have got you weighed down. And you know that the Bible tells us cast our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. Maybe you just want to say, God, here he is. I can't carry it. I give it to you. We're going to sing a final hymn as we do. I want that to be your opportunity. We call it a hymn of invitation. And it's your opportunity to, to, to say yes to whatever God's inviting you to do in your life. Maybe it's surrender your life to him. As you pray to give your life to Jesus, I should do something. Let everybody else know it. <coughs> Step out from where you are. Come say, preacher, I just prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. I'd love to stand beside you and tell this congregation that you now belong to Jesus. Maybe it's confession of sin. Maybe you want to do that right where you're standing, or maybe you want to come to this altar and kneel and say, God, forgive me. Maybe it's just surrendering your life to serve Him. But today, we can spread for you. And that's because of Jesus. When you go out that door, I want you to know that you're experiencing that freedom as well. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray for every person here. Each person that's heard your word, that's been spoken to with your spirit, that Lord, they will say yes to you. Maybe it's for salvation. Maybe it's to, to, to rededicate their life to you and serving you. Maybe it's to ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's to give you a burden. But whatever it is that you that you've given on our heart, I just pray that they say yes. And that they'll surrender their everything to you today. I pray, Lord, that every person here leaves knowing the freedom that you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray.